you say about you God only knows how it's killing you But there's a kind of love that God only knows God only knows what you've been through God only knows what they say about you But God only knows the real you There's a kind of love All right. Good morning and welcome. Um, hope you're ready to worship here this morning, um, to grow, to learn, to be drawn in, to encourage one another, to challenge one another. Right? It's, it's not just about you and me. It's about us as a body of Christ and doing the work that God has asked us to. Uh, before we get into worship, a couple of announcements. Um, Sweetheart's Dinner is tonight at 6 p.m. Um, guys, if you haven't signed up, there's still time to sign up. Um, we've been showing up. We ask that you show up between like 3 and 5 to be able to set up and do final prep. Ladies, if you have not signed up, um, there's still time to do that to be able to come into fellowship. The sign-up sheet is on your way out at the information table. Um, if you'd like to sign up, go ahead and put your name down, um, chicken or beef, and then be able to just come in between 5.30 and 6, and uh, we'll have dinner starting at 6 o'clock. Um, following service today, there's a financial board meeting um, after church, so probably, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes after church if you want to meet in the conference room, if you're interested in the finances, um, that is available to all. Uh, baptisms next Sunday. Um, I know that we have one for sure, um, most likely two coming in for baptism, possibly a third, um, which is an awesome thing to see how the Lord is moving in the midst of, of his people, um, drawing them to himself. Um, so if, you have, if you're interested, please see myself, please see Phil Knapp. Um, we'd love to get you down and be able to walk you through that path to take that step of baptism, that step of obedience. And lastly, college people, right? Uh, there's an application for a scholarship. If you guys are interested, if you're all flush with cash, great. If you need, need help, even better, right? Um, we've had good success with this so far. Um, so far, everybody who has applied for this scholarship has gotten it. It's between one and four thousand dollars a semester. Um, if you're interested in it, see me after. I've got the, the you know the sheet. You guys can fill it out. I'll fill out um, on that, you know the application um, as well. The biggest thing they're looking for is that you're active and involved in the local church or a ministry on campus. So if that's something that you're interested in. You're, you know need some scholarship funds down that path. Please see me, um, and we can get that taken care of as well. 
Let's go ahead and open in prayer, and we'll get into worship. Father God, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you that we get to come in to gather with our brothers and sisters to worship you, to give praise, honor, and glory to the one who has laid down his life for us. Jesus, we desire to see you high and lifted up in our lives personally, but also in our lives corporately as a church. Lord, that you would be the one that is honored in this place. You are the one that we are motivated to serve and to love and to lay down our lives for, and that we would leave this place to carry that message to a lost and dying world. Lord, I, I pray that my brothers and sisters would be motivated by that this morning to, to come and to be changed so that they can go out and share that message um, with other people, whether, that, whether it's in their workplace or in their home, in their neighborhoods, in their classrooms, whatever it is, God, that you would, that you would put a, a passion in our hearts to share the truth of the gospel with people. And it starts by us lifting up our hearts and our voices to you, the one that we adore and that we love. So the Lord be lifted up high. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just stand and join us.
that we would first think about your love. We would think about your reckless love, the love that came. Jesus, you came close. You didn't have to do it. Yet you poured out every drop of your love for us on that cross. Every drop. So we remember your love this morning. We remember your love this morning, Jesus, and we are thankful. We want to pour out every drop on you to move the heart of Jesus. <laughs> it is our desire, it's our one thing, to move you, Jesus. And the way that we do that is in our authenticity. It's in what we give you, what we bring you. You don't desire sacrifices. You desire a heart sold out for you, a life as a living sacrifice. And we give that to you this morning, Jesus. Our response is, put us anywhere. <laughs> I'll go anywhere if I can see you. I'll go anywhere if I can be with you because we are sold out lovers for you. Realign our hearts, God. Realign our hearts to have Jesus as the first place. Jesus as our first love, his rightful spot. Lord, I repent for the times that I have not had Jesus at the rightful spot, the first place. Come realign our hearts this morning. You're our joy. It is our delight to love you. It is our joy to serve you, to come close. So Holy Spirit, come close in this message. Speak to our hearts that we can better love Jesus, that we can better love the ones around us, that we would know who we are, and in turn can 
speak that over others' lives, who they are, that we would know who you are. <laughs> we would know, Father, who you are, how you love us, how you see us. You would come and heal us this morning. We love you. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We'll never grow tired of saying it. We love you, Jesus. Let those words not just roll off our tongues as a meaningless thing that we say, but let us feel the weight of it, that we love you. Let's just sing this chorus one last time. For all is for your glory. And all is for your praise. And all is for your glory. God, we give it all to you and all your praise. Pray that that is truly your heart's response, that where Jesus asks you to go, you're willing to go. That what he asks you to do, you're willing to do, because, you know, that is truly what it is that the Father desires of us, of us laying down our lives, that it's not about what we want and what we desire, but it's about what he wants and what he desires. And we have to be willing to follow him no matter where it is that he leads, because he is faithful, because he is good, because he is our loving Heavenly Father who isn't going to put us in spots that are going to destroy us. Right? They might not be the easiest spots, but they're spots that if he is leading us there, they're the best spot in the world to be, even if it's a difficult spot, you know, even if it's hard on the flesh. Right? It's a good spot to be. It's probably the best spot to be is where it is that he is. Right? I'd rather be in a hard spot with Jesus than in a good spot without him. And I pray that it would be your desire as well. And so we're continuing our series this morning on who we are, our identity in Christ. And if you're here this morning and you've been sitting here the last few weeks, we've started to realize that I'm a child of God and we spent a couple weeks on that. And I hope that that has started to sink in, that you truly believe that you're a son or a daughter of the Most High, that he is for you and not against you, that he is sitting there with open arms ready to receive you, that we can go to him with anything. And he's like, yep, bring it. I'm here. Right? I, my arms are open to, to receive you. And then we looked last week about the fact that we're accepted and not rejected. Right? And that is absolutely true. And rejection is a huge issue in our society today. Um, and we need to be or allow the Holy Spirit to penetrate into our hearts with the message that we are accepted, that our Heavenly Father accepts us, not because of anything we have done, not because of anything that we are, but because He loves us and He wants to be in relationship and in fellowship with you. Right? And that, that is what motivates Him to accept and not reject. But if those two things are true, right, which they are, and if you believe they're true for yourself, then there's a third one here this morning that we're going to look at um, that is true of your identity as well. Unfortunately, I think it's a part of our identity that many of us refuse. <laughs> many of us fight back and push back against, um, saying that we can't do it or it's not my calling or that's for somebody else. But Scripture doesn't really leave us this option. That scripture doesn't leave that out and go, well, it's okay, right? This, this isn't for everybody. He says, no, if you're a child, if you're accepted and not rejected, then this is absolutely positively who you are. And, and in that, that identity we're going to look at this morning is the fact that you and I are ambassadors for Christ. You and I are ambassadors for Christ. Right? For two things, right? It, there's, there's, there's a kind of, you know, two for one today. We're not going to look at it a whole lot, right? but when we look in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 21, which is where we're going to settle, right, there's also, you could sit in there, we could look at the fact that you and I are reconciled, right? So kind of a two for one, you're, you're reconciled to the Father, right? There's nothing that you and I have to do anymore. God has done all of that work to reconcile our relationship. You and I were at odds. You and I were in sin. You and I were the ones who 
caused the, the break in our relationship with the Father. And yet the Father, right, who we're enemies with, the Father goes, no, no, what? No, no, I, don't, I no longer want to be separated. I no longer want to be alienated from, my, from these people. And so he takes, he takes action, and he reconciles you and I to him, and then he commands us or positions us and says that you're an ambassador of Christ. Now, they've been saying when we understand our identity, it changes the way we live. And it's the same thing with ambassador. But when we realize that we're an ambassador for Christ, how you approach people will change. And if you see yourself as an ambassador for Christ, when you interact with people, you're now realizing that I have a king to represent to them. I'm not just representing myself to this person that I'm interacting with today. I'm representing a king who has sent me, who has commissioned me, who has appointed me to be an ambassador to present him to everybody I come in contact with. And it also changes the way you live, how you approach life, right? If I'm an ambassador, that means my life isn't my own. Your life isn't your own. But if you're an ambassador of Christ, that means there's a specific marching orders that you have been given, that I have been given, that we're called to fulfill. And are we willing to fulfill those things? Are we, allowing to allow, are we willing to allow him to change our lives that it becomes about everything he wants? That he is truly in that first place and he's, and he's guiding and leading our lives. So let me define ambassador real quick. Most of you probably know what one is or have seen it or have heard of it or whatever down that path. But an ambassador is a diplomatic official of the highest rank sent by a government to represent it on a temporary mission in another land. Right, big, long description. Right? It's an ambassador is somebody who has been sent by a government to represent it in another land. The interesting thing is as I was going through this idea of ambassador, in the Roman time there was two different ambassadors. There was two different provinces, and one of the provinces was in agreement with Rome. One of the provinces was, you know, was there, and they, they didn't fight against Rome. They weren't at war with Rome, and so they would send certain people there. But then an ambassador was sent to that part of that country or that, that nation or, that, or you know, that, that place where they were at war and they were at odds with Rome. And that's where ambassadors were sent. Kind of looks like us, right? We're truly in a world that is at war with our Father. Right? And so our Father has sent us, our King has sent us as ambassadors to a hostile land to represent Him. To bring a message to these people that, you know what, our, the King wants to be reconciled with you. He wants to be in relationship with you again. Right? He knows that your, your relationship is broken, but He wants to, you to come back. Right? So as an ambassador of Christ, you and I are to represent Christ. We're to speak for Christ, right? We're supposed to love others for Christ, like Christ would love them. We're supposed to offer mercy and grace to others the same way God would represent mercy and grace. Right? The very things that we have experienced in our own relationship with Christ, he asks us to take that reality and that truth and pass it on to other people. And you sit here and you go, well, what qualifies me for that? Right? What qualifies me for that? We're going to look at, as I said, 1 Corinthians 5, 18 through 21, and we're going to you know, explain that and walk it through. Here's the battle. Right? Here's the struggle. And here's why I think so many of us, myself included at times, go, I'd rather not be an ambassador because here's the truth. That means that those whom we represent him to make their judgment about who Christ is based off of you and me. You're like, well, that seems a little harsh. How is it possible that God would send a broken vessel like me to represent a perfect being, and then these people who see me are going to make their interpretation about who God is based off of me? That's what an ambassador does, is it not? An ambassador represents their country. And what that country and how that ambassador presents himself often reflects on how it is that others view your king. Mahatma Gandhi at one point had said this. He goes, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christian. What a, what a scathing rebuke in this regard. He continues on. If you left it there, it would be fine. Right? Okay, that's fine. You like Jesus. You don't like me. No big deal. You don't like me. But he goes this. He continues the statement. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Ouch. Right? So... These Christians, right, you and me, people like you and me that were presenting, you know, and representing God's kingdom, 
in Mahatma Gandhi's backyard. He goes, I like your cries, but I don't like your Christians because they don't look like him. And that shouldn't be the case. Right? And so there's so many times in my own life that if I sit down and I examine it, that I have to be willing to go, did my life look like Christ today? And if it didn't, I need to repent of that. If it didn't, I need to go, hey, God, you know what? I wasn't a very good representative of your kingdom today. Would you help me? Right? And this is the beauty of it. Right? God says, yes, you are my ambassador. You are equipped. Yes, maybe you stumbled, fell, didn't do it very well, but get back up again because I'm still asking you to represent me to a lost and dying world. Every one of us in this room, every one of us online, right? Not just me up here preaching the gospel, sharing this truth, right? Every one of us is called an ambassador of Christ. So we might want to start letting that settle in a little bit and going, well, I guess I don't get to point a finger at somebody else and go, that's their job to go and be an ambassador. I know it's your job so that when we get up from here today, right, I pray that you're going, all right, that's who I am. I'm an ambassador of Christ. Who can I go represent him to? How is it that I can represent God's kingdom when I go to the store, when I go back to my home, when I go to the workplace tomorrow? How do I represent Christ? I want to do that more effectively. And so if you're not there already, flip open to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll start in verse 16, but the core of this verse that we're going to look at is 18 through 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Now, there's another one we could sit and ponder and meditate on about what does a new creation look like? Because you're a new creation, whether you like to admit it or not, right? Well, my physical frame didn't change. He goes, that's okay. The spirit man did. You're a completely new creation. Continues on in verse 18. All this is from God, who, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Here it is. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For, you, for our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Right, so in these short verses, in, in verses 18 through 21, there's three things that we'll look at. There's the basis for our ambassadorship. Right, there's the foundations of how it is that we get there. There's the message of it. And then there's also the calling, obviously, in verse 20 that says, you're now my ambassador, go do the work. Right, so there's the basis, the message, and, the, and then the calling to go forward. So the first one is the basis. Did you and I make ourselves ambassadors of Christ? Nope. Does anybody who comes to this country from another country that's an ambassador, they just go, well, you know what? I'm just going to be an ambassador, and I'm going to represent my king, and I'm going to represent my nation, and so that's how I'm going to do it. They don't get to make that call for themselves. Right? It is God who has set aside his people to be ambassadors for Christ. The basis for Paul's ministry in here in 2 Corinthians 5.21, you know, in this portion, is his own reconciliation with God. Paul was reconciled to the Father. Right? And that's why he says it in verses 18. Right? All this is from God who reconciled us through Christ. God broke in and reconciled you and I. Did God have to save Paul? No. Did he have to save you and me? No. Did you and I need to be reconciled to him? Yeah. Right? And he's done that work. He didn't have to. He chose to because of the love that we sang about this morning, right? That, that pursues us, that there's no mountain you won't climb up and all those things, right? His love compels him and goes, I want these people reconciled to myself. I'm going to do something. I'm going to make a way that that's possible. Keep your finger in 2 Corinthians and slide to Roman, back to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 5. We start to realize where Paul talks about reconciliation again. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Right, just so we make sure that we catch God's love again. But God chose his love for us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
Right? Not when we were good, not when we were cleaned up, when we were a mess, when we were broken, when we were in depths of sin. Right? God demonstrates his love and says, I'm sending my son for you. I want you to see this. It wasn't because of anything you've done. It's because of my great love for you that I'm sending Christ. Verse 9, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Here it is. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Right? How are we joyful? How joyful? How, how excited are you that you've been reconciled to the God of the universe? Right? Paul goes, he rejoices in that fact. That because of God, sending Jesus Christ, we could be reconciled. If he doesn't do that, we're still lost. Our relationship is still broken. We're still alienated from God. Right now, we're the ones sitting here. God's kingdom is over there. Right? I'm not, it's not, but you know, God's kingdom is over there. Here's earth, and we're at odds with him. And there's no hopes of ever getting to his kingdom. None. Right? So God sends his son and goes, I want to make a way that that, 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 that that distance can be shrunk so that people can enter my kingdom, that we can be reconciled again, that we can be friends. And other than friends, we can be father-son, father-daughter relationship. Every one of us here this morning, I hope, right, will acknowledge that we were enemies of God at some point. Right? We were all enemies of God at some point. Maybe if you haven't trusted in Christ, maybe that's still where you're at. And maybe the Holy Spirit is going, you know what, I want you to see that you're my enemy, but I love my enemies more than you even know. And I sent my son that you might no longer have to be separated and be at odds with me. Right? God reconciled us to him. And so one author puts the analogy this way, is the fact that imagine that you were guilty of committing a crime. And you're sitting in, in, in the jury, right? you're sitting in the trial, they find you guilty. And they say, well, because it's so heinous, because it's so terrible, right, they now have committed you to death. And the judge goes, this death is going to happen. There's nothing you can do about it. You're guilty. And in your own heart, you're going, I know I am. And so you sit there and you beg and you plead and you go, yeah, but I have this and I have this. God, you know, won't you just be lenient? Won't you, you know, I'll change. And can't you just shorten the sentence? Do not have to put me to death. He goes, no, there is no option. You're going to be put to death. But then in that moment, right, when that's going to happen, all of a sudden your enemy, right, the one who you've committed this act against, steps up and goes, I'll die instead. Wouldn't happen in the real world, right? <laughs> the, the, those things don't happen here on earth. Right, they, we in our flesh, people don't get in their flesh and go, you know what, they did all these things to me, and you know what, I'll, I'll be willing to die or I'll go, in, I'll go to prison in place of. But that, that's exactly what Jesus did for us, is it not? We did all of the sinning. We did all of the offense. We did all of that side. We were absolute enemies. And God goes, I'm the one who's wounded here, but I'm going to take the punishment so they don't have to. So that you and I could be reconciled. And I don't know about you, but that's an amazing thing when you think about it. Verse 19 in, first, in Second Corinthians, if you remember, it says, not counting their sins against them. Right? God in Christ no longer counts my sin and your sin against us. Right? Verse 21, if you remember when you read it, if you're not there, you know, maybe you want to look back at it at some point here, right? As it goes, he goes, he made him who knew no sin to be sin, so that you and I could become the righteousness of God. Right, all of a sudden, we went from being sinful, right, at odds, and Jesus goes, I'm going to take their punishment so they can take on me. Right, there's a swap going on. Right, we need to always remember that God didn't need to be reconciled with us. Right? He does not need to make things right. He didn't do anything wrong. Right, he, it's not like he's coming to make amends and going, I'm really sorry, John, I, you know, I did this wrong. He goes, I didn't do anything. And yet he's the one who comes and initiates our relationship again. 
that that broken relationship that you and I had because of our sin was fixed because the Father sent us. And that's the basis of our ministry or our identity as an ambassador. Because if we're not reconciled, if we're not sons and daughters, there's no way we can be ambassadors over here. None. It's not possible. Right? We're not going to do that the way it's been called to do. So that's the basis. And so as I've been doing over the last few weeks, a few action steps to think about. Right? I'm going to put an action step to the bottom of this. Right? This week, and I want to challenge you, and we mentioned it yesterday at Men's Breakfast, a little different thought process. Um, but it's very similar. Right? I, I challenge you to remind yourself daily this week of your reconciliation to God. Right? What it costs to reconcile you back to your Heavenly Father. Right? Remind yourself all the time. Daily, find an opportunity. It goes back to Martin Luther. Right? He says that he preaches the gospel to himself daily because he's prone to forget. And he preaches the gospel to his congregation weekly because they're prone to forget. Right? And so we need to remind ourselves daily of this reconciliation that's taken place because it's the basis of our identity as an ambassador. Because we're reconciled, we can now be ambassadors to pro- proclaim that same reconciliation to those who do not know Christ, who have not experienced Christ yet. Are we ready for the, for the challenge? Maybe, maybe not. But I think it starts in the understanding that it is ready for me to do it, and it's ready for you to do it. Which brings us to the message of our message of our of our ministry. Back to verse nineteen of Second Corinthians five. That is in the end of verse eighteen, right? He has gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Maybe you're sitting here going, "There's better people than me to be that minister of reconciliation," right? God goes, "No, there's not any better minister of reconciliation than me." Right? There's people that you will reconcile or bring the ministry of reconciliation to that I will never ever. Right, there's people that when you guys go to campus Monday, right, and you go to class, if that you know you, you interact with your, I'm never going to see them. I can't represent God's kingdom to them. You guys can, I can't. Right, when you guys go to work tomorrow, wherever that workplace is, I can't go there. I'm never going to have the opportunity to represent them there. But you do. So there's nobody more qualified to represent them because He's given us very clearly. He's given you and I the ministry of reconciliation. Here's the message of verse 19. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Right? This message is not about what you and I have done, because <laughs> we've done nothing. Right? This message isn't about, look at how hard I worked or how much I did. We've done nothing. God reconciled you and me to himself. He did all of the work through Christ. Right, and that is the message of our ministry. Right, it includes an acknowledgement that we all need God's forgiveness. It includes an acknowledgement that sin has destroyed the relationship with God and that this same sin destroys relationships here all the time on the horizontal plane. Right, our sin and our selfishness, unfortunately, strains relationships constantly. And he goes, there's a reconciliation for that. There's a way to deal with that. And I want you to carry that to people, that they can be reconciled back to me. It's a message of how someone changes from being an enemy, as we saw in Romans 5, to being a friend. (laughs) Who wants to carry that kind of message? Who wants to to go out and go, you know what, I want to show you, I want to express to you, I want to represent to you that you no longer have to be at odds with God. He's made a way that you can be one with him again. He's made a way that you can be in relationship with him again. He's made a way that you can be friends and sons and daughters and embraced by him instead of having to fear his wrath. It doesn't have to be that way anymore. And he's given us that message to carry forth. Right? It includes our righteousness. Slide down, if you're in Second Corinthians, slide down to 21. Right? We need to help people see this, that it's possible. Verse 21, for our sake, He made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Right? We weren't righteous. We can't be righteous in our own flesh. It's not possible. And I know for years, right, early on, especially in my Christian walk, maybe I I worked really hard to make myself righteous until you realize it's not possible. 
And I think there's people out in the world today that are sitting there going, if I just do all the right things, I'll be right with God. And it's not true. And it's not possible to be making yourself right with God. We need to allow God to make us right with him through Christ. And that's the message we're supposed to carry on to them. Right, that because of Jesus Christ coming to earth, living the perfect life, willingly going to the cross, being mocked, abused, murdered, you know, put to, put to death on the cross, buried in the grave, right? Because of that, you and I can be reconciled. If we'll trust in Him, if we'll turn from our ways, if we'll repent and go, you know what, Jesus, I need you. I can't do it by myself. He goes, done, reconciled in that moment, right? It's an amazing thing, and he goes, I'm asking you, right, if you've experienced that, I'm asking you, I've commissioned you, I've, I've entitled you to be an ambassador to carry that same message to people who don't ever hear it. Or maybe they've heard it, and they just never understood it, or maybe they've never received it, and as I said, and I went back and I double-checked, and it's 7.6 times before most people respond to Christ. 7.6 interactions before they come to Christ. Right? So as we go out and represent him as his ambassadors and we bring this message of reconciliation that we have experienced that should transform the way we live right? because we're no longer enemies. Right? So as it changes our relationship, he goes, go pass that on, please. Go, go give that to other people that their sins can be washed away, that they can be made pure, that they can be made righteous, that they no longer have to exhaust themselves trying to be good enough. Because there is no good enough apart from Christ. And so I have a challenge, right? The, the action step. And, I, and I've heard it from many a people. Right? I don't know how to share it. I don't know what to say. Right? I challenge you this week, right? To sit and to spend some time looking at these verses, right? Verse 19 specifically, right? That in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Right? So there's the message, right? Christ came and God goes, if you'll trust Christ, I'm not going to count your sins against you anymore. We can be reconciled. Right? The gospel message in a nutshell. Be reconciled to God. Right? And put that to memory in such a way that when you go out from your home or your workplace or your school or wherever you're at, that you're ready to share that at a moment's notice. Right? If, you'd not, if you're not sure what that is, um, I would love to sit and chat with you, right? Let's set up a time and sit down and maybe we can write up a little something that you can sit and you know, put to memory that goes, here's what it is. And it, there's nothing wrong with having a, a canned presentation up front. Nothing. Right? Until you get so comfortable with it that it so encompasses your life that you go, it doesn't matter. I don't need that anymore because I know what that message is and I can share it with whoever it is and help it to apply to whatever phase of life they're in. But you have to start somewhere. So commit it to memory, right? This message of reconciliation. Speak it to yourself, right? Remind yourself. It kind of goes hand in hand with the first one. If I'm speaking it to myself all the time, if I'm reminding myself all the time that I'm reconciled, I should be ingraining it deeper and deeper in because if it's that's how I'm reconciled, that's how you're reconciled, that's how your lost neighbor will be reconciled, it's the same. But ask God for the boldness to put it in so that you're ready to share it as you go out and interact with the people and actually become that ambassador that you and I have been called to do. Which leads us to the third part of our message, which is verse 20. And therefore, right, because you've been reconciled, because God has commissioned you and commanded you and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, he goes, therefore, because that's true, we are ambassadors for Christ. Here's the amazing part to me in this verse. God is making his appeal through us. <laughs> right? He's just asking you and I to be the mouthpiece. He's asking you and I to be the representative, to be the one willing to go anywhere, which I pray you're saying this morning, right? Put me anywhere. I'll do anything. Because I know and I trust that if I am willing to go, you will make your appeal and you will do what's necessary through me if I'll get out of the way. And he will. He promises to do that. Right, that he will work through you and me and make the same plea. So the basis of the reconciliation, the message is reconciliation, but then we're called to go. Here's the challenge of this, and here's why I think so many people push back against it. Right, we can experience salvation. 
We can receive the message of reconciliation, but if we never go, what good is it? What good is it? The gospel was not meant to stay with us, church. Right? The gospel came to you and me so that it could go out from you and me to other people. It was never meant to stay with us. Right? I mean, it stays with us. It's not like we lose it by giving it away, but it was never meant to stop here. Right? God gave you the ministry of reconciliation so that you could go out and pass that along to other people who will then hopefully, perfectly will be reconciled, will acknowledge their need of a Savior, will come to Christ, will know that they will be reconciled, and thus they will then go out and do the same thing. And it will repeat. Matthew 28, right? Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded, right? Same thing, right? If, we, if all we ever do is receive salvation, and then it sits there, God goes, that wasn't my plan. My plan was is that I reconciled you so that you would be free to go out and help others be reconciled too. But the freedom you have experienced, we can hopefully pass on to other people. We're called to reach and be part of God's mission here on earth. Christ is no longer here. You and I are his hands and feet. You and I are his mouthpiece. Flip with me to Matthew. Keep your finger in 2 Corinthians. Let's go to the book of Matthew. Right, and we hear Jesus' plea, I believe, similar down this path. Matthew chapter 9. I think all of us can acknowledge that the harvest is plentiful, correct? We all have people in our lives that don't know Christ, that haven't been reconciled. And so we go, well, the harvest is plentiful. Right? There's all these people out there that haven't been reconciled. How are they going to be reconciled if you and I don't tell them about it? Ever think of that? Oh, that's right. That's pastor's job. He'll go and reconcile them all. He'll go tell them all about it. Or that's, you know, the Bible study leader's responsibility or that. That's not true. So Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 through 38. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And so he sees these people, they're struggling, he's one man. Can he be everywhere at once? No. And so he's seeing all these people, he goes, I can't possibly get to all these people. I can't do it myself. And so if Jesus couldn't do it himself, you can't do it yourself, I can't do it myself. And so what does Jesus say? He says, looks at his disciples and he says to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest, to send out laborers into his harvest. And he might as well just said, you know what? Pray that the Lord would send forth ambassadors out into the world to represent my kingdom. So that they would see and hear the message of reconciliation that they might turn. It's a church-wide responsibility. Right? Jesus himself, as he's out there and he's seeing all the people, he's seeing the masses of people, he goes, I can't do it. I'm one. I don't have enough. I, he's going to reconcile us as a mass, but he can't get the message out to all of them at last. So he says, send, ask the Lord to send forth laborers into the harvest field. And I think he's still asking that as Paul's talking to the Corinthians. He's telling them, you're ambassadors of Christ. Go to work. Right? And that message is still coming to Hope Fellowship today in 2021. Right? You're ambassadors of Christ. If you've trusted in, go do the work. It, 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 the, the harvest field is plentiful across this community. Plentiful. There is so many people out there that have not been reconciled to the Father, and we, we have the opportunity to go and do that. So Paul was sent as that ambassador, right, as, as, as to announce God's plan to be reconciled, and they're asking you and I to do the same. Right? And it made it available when God's ambassador spread the message. How will they know to be reconciled if we don't tell them? <laughs> yeah, it's okay. They could go online or they could, maybe they'll show up in the church, but you know what? I wasn't looking for the church at, when I came to the church. Instead, there was a, a man that both Mary and I worked with <laughs> that invited us to the church. I haven't left since I came. But had he not come up and goes, hey, by the way, won't you come to church with me? 
And he had talked with Mary about it as well. Mary was looking for the church. I wasn't looking for the church. Right? I, whatever. I'll go to church with you if that's what you want. But this individual invited and shared this need. He was an ambassador, and he lived his life in such a way that it wasn't judging, wasn't condemning, was instead very loving, very accepting, very open, and going, I just want to walk with you. Scott Mannon, and it was a huge blessing in my life, because without him demonstrating that kind of love up front prior to coming to church, I don't know that I'd be here today. Obviously, God has a plan, and that'll all unfold, but right, he, had, he was faithful to be an ambassador. Romans chapter 10 Romans chapter 10 talks to this effect of this need to come to faith and to come to know Christ. Romans 10, starting in verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We all believe that to be true, correct? I pray you do, right? That this is absolutely true. If I will call on the name of Jesus Christ, I will be saved, because that's what God says he does. Well, how are they going to call on him? Continues on, Paul looks to the Romans and he writes in verse 14, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And the fault in that is we read that and go, see, that's what Sunday church is all about. Not true. Right? That's not true. That's not what this is all about. Right? Paul isn't in church right now. Paul is writing a letter to a a church-wide thing and says, how are they going to hear unless somebody preaches, unless somebody opens their mouth and says something to them? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? Ambassadors are what? Sent. By a country to another nation to represent the nation. Paul says in Romans 10, right? How are they to hear without someone preaching, and how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed, and it continues on through Isaiah. Right? But at, the, um, at the verse 17, faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Right? We have to be faithful ambassadors to speak the truth of reconciliation that they might have the opportunity to respond. Right? If they're not responding, we go, well, that's not, they're just not listening. He goes, God instead goes, have you told them? Have you spoke about the reconciliation you've experienced? Right? Or instead, are we ashamed to share about the reconciliation we have because they might not accept us and they might reject us? And we talked about that a little bit last week, right? That if we're accepted by God, right, we can challenge and we can take the risk of being rejected by man when we represent Christ. Right? So they all start to inter- these identity markers all start to interrelate to one another. We're ambassadors of Christ, church. To represent him to a lost world that doesn't know and may not ever hear. And like I said, it's not work of one man or 20 men. It's a work of the entire church because there's so many out there that need to hear the truth that they can be reconciled to God. That you and I are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ because we've been reconciled. But then notice, in, if you're back in 2 Corinthians, slide down, second half of verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ, making, God making his appeal through us. And then we come to the second half of that verse. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Right? You might as well, instead of implore, which doesn't seem like a word that we use very much, instead put in beg. Right? Maybe you just want to jot that in your, in, your, you know, in your margins or whatever. That word actually means to beg, to plead that they would come and be reconciled to God. Do we have that kind of urgency for the lost ones in our lives? Do we have that kind of, 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 of passion that goes, they need to know, they, they, they need to come to Christ, they need to be reconciled. I'm pleading with you, please, 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 listen to the message of reconciliation. Right? I'm pouring my life, I'm not just going to ask, oh, it's so polite. No, I'm imploring you. 
I'm begging you to listen to the message of reconciliation. I want you to come to know it. And this is similar to the man, you know, when Jesus was walking by and he goes, please come and sir, you know, please come and help me. Please come and help me. My son is dying. And he didn't just go up and, well, Jesus, would you help me? Oh, no, you won't. Okay, never mind. I'll just walk away. Right? That isn't what he did. He pleaded with Jesus, please come. I know you're able. I need you to come and help because he's dying. And I think we would do the same thing in the natural sense. If our children or if our brother or sister was dying, we'd be passionately pursuing how to help them. Newsflash, there is people dying eternally. That need to have that same passion and commitment that we would pour in to get them physically well, we need to be willing to put that same kind of passion and energy to help them be spiritually well. Right? Because they need it, church. They don't know what they don't know. Right? And, and unfortunately, they see it and they go, well, when I look at the church, I don't necessarily see that they have anything changed either, and that's our own fault. Because well, maybe we're not being faithful ambassadors. Are we willing to do it? God is asking us. He has commanded us. He goes, you're my ambassadors. Go preach it. Have a passion and an and a, and a urgency to the message because it is urgent, because we don't know that they have another day. We really don't. Right? It, it, you might go and you might hang out with a friend or a loved one today, and maybe God has been impressing upon your heart. You need to ask them. You need to, you know, you need to explain this ministry, of, you know, this reconciliation that's possible. And you go, uh, maybe next time. What if there's not a next time? There might not be. Right? We're not guaranteed tomorrow. Either they or us. Right, maybe God is sending you there, and he's like, this is, the, you know, this is that opportunity for that they would be reconciled. And you go, well, you know, I'm, just, you know, I'm really kind of nervous. I don't really know. And he goes, take the risk because you just don't know. Maybe you won't be there tomorrow, or maybe they won't be. Even worse. Right, if you're not there tomorrow because you, you, the Lord decides to take you home, you know where you're going. If the Lord decides, you know, if the Lord just says their, their number is up instead, and they don't know Christ, and they haven't been reconciled, they're going to spend eternity in hell, separated eternally from God the Father. Are we willing to take that risk? Are we willing to allow ourselves to become complacent and go, well, it's not that big of a deal? Our ambassadorship is huge, church. God has called us and equipped us to go down that path with a message that is urgent. And then lastly, right, when and where. So often I think we debate and we say our ambassadorship is circumstantial. I can be an ambassador when I'm in a Bible study. I can be an ambassador when I'm, you know, when I'm with this group or whatever. An ambassador is an ambassador 24-7, are they not? When, they, when somebody sends a, an ambassador to this country, they're an ambassador 24-7, 365 if they hear that long. There's not a moment where they should not be living their lives as a representative of their country. It should be the same for you and me. It doesn't matter where we're at, right? We are called to be an ambassador all the time. Is that easy? No, not easy. Is it a challenge? Yes. <laughs> right? I'm not, you know, are we doing it perfectly? I'm not. Right? And that was a challenge as I was preparing this week. This question was brought up. How well do you represent Jesus? How well are you doing as an ambassador for Christ? And I'm like, ah, hooch. Does my life all the time give a good representation of Christ? Is my message, right, is the ministry of reconciliation high up there on my list? That when I come in contact with lost people, am I sharing this message with them? Or am I sharing all these other things and sharing about life and sharing about sports and sharing about this and sharing about that, but I never get to the ministry of reconciliation? I never tell them that they need to be reconciled to the Father. And in my mind, I'm going, I know they're lost. I know they don't know God, and, but ah, that's okay, and it shouldn't be. I need help. You know, Holy Spirit, bring it to me that in that moment that I, I, that I can't contain it anymore. I bring such conviction that I have to speak it forth because they need it more than anything else. How well do you represent Christ? Right, we're supposed to represent him at home, at work, at school, in the gym, at the sports arenas, in the restaurants, in the grocery stores. Right, we're on duty all the time. Everybody we come in contact with should see Christ through you and me. Right? We're asked to represent him all the time. 
And so, I, I, like I said, that, that question is a challenge to me. Okay? Another author put it this way. He goes, if Jesus took you home right now and asked you to give an accounting of how well you represented him while on earth, what would you say? I'm like, good boy. <laughs> Don't take me home yet, God. <laughs> I, I, I'd like to improve my, my grade a little bit before we get there, right? I'd like to be a little bit farther down the line, if you will. But I got some work to do of how well I'm representing him. My guess is you probably do too, and that's okay. Right? It's a matter of are we willing to go, okay, I am an ambassador. I'm going to allow that to change my mindset, and now I'm going to start to do the work he's asked me to in an increasing fashion. And we're all going to be here to help one another to do that, to encourage one another to do that, to support one another in that. Right? But we have to be honest. We have to be authentic with one another. I need help. Would you, you know, would you walk with me? Would you show me? What do you, how do you do it? What do you say to somebody? What, right? And we start to share those things so that we can go out and advance God's kingdom. Action step. If you don't, haven't figured it out already, it's, it's, it's going to maybe put you out of your comfort zone, right? Whom are, to whom is God asking you to implore they be reconciled to him? Right? Who is it that God has been placing on your heart, right, that you would beg them to be reconciled to God. Right? And if you have that person clearly in mind, right, maybe you're willing to take the risk and say, I commit to doing that this week. Or I commit to doing that the next time I see them. Maybe they're in another part of the country and you don't necessarily have an opportunity to do it this week. Right? But I commit to that. Next time I see them, I'm going to bring up that they need to be reconciled to the Father. I need to make sure that they are reconciled to the Father because maybe you don't know. Right? But commit to that, right? to, to, to making an opportunity that I'm going to represent him in my words to people. And I'm going to ask that they be reconciled to God the Father, that they too might experience what we have experienced. Will we be faithful ambassadors? Because we don't know what that's going to look like. So there we have it, First Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 5, 18-21. We have the basis, our reconciliation with the Father ourselves. If you are here this morning and you are a child of God, that means you've been reconciled to God. He goes, there is the basis of your being an ambassador. You know what it takes. Take that message of your reconciliation and share that with all those who don't know it yet. And then go do it. Right? Be ambassadors of me. Share that everywhere you go, all the time, no matter where you're at. Represent me to a lost and dying world. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you for my brothers and sisters, I pray that you would help to saturate our minds with this truth. Lord, I, I, I pray that we would truly take on our identity as ambassadors and it would start to change the way we live and interact with people. That we would see it that we're supposed to be constantly representing you in your kingdom. God, that we would not take it lightly, but that we would move forward. Lord, I'm gonna, and then I'm going to share a quick prayer from Neil Anderson on this fact. And it's something that I prayed this week for myself. It says, I thank you for sending Jesus who had no sin to be sin for me in order that I may be righteous in him. God, we thank you for making me a new creation in Christ. God, help me. I want to be a good ambassador for you. I renounce the lies of Satan that I am unqualified and unworthy to represent you. Lord, I ask that if there's brothers and sisters here this morning, that that is the thought that's entered in their mind, that you would silence the voice of the enemy. That you would replace it with the truth that says, if you've been reconciled to me, you have been gifted and called and equipped and, and enabled to be an ambassador. Don't let the lies of the enemy, the father of lies, speak it over you any longer. You have made me worthy by your presence in my life. Lord, teach me to see people as you see them. Guard my mouth so that I will only be used to edify. Forgive me for the times that I have used my mouth to hurt instead of heal, to put down instead of to build up. I want to have a ministry of reconciliation so others can be reconciled to you as I have been. Lord, and I pray that that would be our heart's desire. Lord, that you would put people in our paths, that we would be those laborers in the harvest field that are going out to proclaim the message of reconciliation. Lord, that we would not be able to rest easy about it. Lord, that we would be compelled by love to go forth and to, to seek and to save the lost like you were. That we would truly have that same heart's desire. That they might hear the truth and they might respond. Because it says very clearly in your word, God, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. And how will they hear unless we're sent? And you have sent us. You have commissioned us. 
You have ordained us. You have called us to go forth as ambassadors. Would you help us to walk in that identity of ours, God? Would you help it to become integral in how we leave this place? That when we go this afternoon, that it's in the forefront of our minds that we are reconciled and we're ambassadors to other people in the grocery stores, in the restaurants, and in our homes. Lead us down this path. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.